How you doing, Amber? I'm doing well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. Take it away. All right. Great. So hi, everybody. Um, welcome to my talk on untraditional geology field trips. Um, I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible. We have a couple of breakout discussion sessions planned. Um, and I know that not all of you are gonna be teaching purely geology or maybe ever teach geology in your classes. So I'm trying to make this content um, as you know overarching as possible and touch on some common themes that I know we all have in common. And so to get us started on that, um, I would like you to think about a time um, when you couldn't figure out how to present certain content to your students, say, you know, maybe others present it one certain way and all the support and resources for that, you know, certain content are set up that way. And here you are um, and you can't do it that way for whatever reason. Um, and so you had to kind of really think hard to find like a creative solution. Um, and you weren't even sure if it was gonna work, but you know, this is what you've got. And maybe in the end, you know, you really liked what you came up with, or maybe, you know, it was a total epic fail. Um, and I think probably in most cases, at least for me, um, it's usually a little bit of both. Um, and, and, uh, and so I think that, that in this session, we can kind of learn a lot if we share with each other something about, you know, some challenges we've faced. Um, and they're not all gonna be exactly the same. I teach at a community college, so that's maybe a little bit different. Um, for the last year and a half, I've been teaching um, entirely online and asynchronously. So that's you know, maybe a lot different, or you know, maybe there's some overlap, um, but I'm sure there's, there will be some similarities in our challenges and probably in some of the, the ways we approach solving those challenges. Um, so if you can think about a time like that, um, I'm going to have us share a little bit more about that um, and kind of learn from one another. Um, and so since uh, part of that is thinking about like the times that you've failed, um, which for me are not very easy to remember, I think number one, because I there, there's like two reasons. So I, number one, <laughs> try to immediately stop failing. <laughs> um, and then number two, I immediately try to forget that I ever failed, right? Because it's just painful sometimes to, to think about that. But you guys know, and I know I tell my students all the time, like failure is the sweet spot for learning. Um, and, and so it really does help to kind of dredge up your darkest memories <laughs> and epic fails to kind of pick apart and learn like, how did we approach that? How did we overcome it? And, and you know, how did we, we get through that? So while you're dredging up <laughs> some of your worst fails, um, I'm gonna tell you about some of mine. <laughs> so um, my big challenge that I'm gonna tell you about um, is geology field trips. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking because geology has some of the most amazing geology, uh, or Michigan, sorry, Michigan has some of the most amazing geology. So it's just tough because a lot of times it's hidden. Um, it's under a big pile of glacial sediments. Um, that, so there's not a lot of rocks that stick out of the ground. Um, or, you know, maybe there's some rocks that stick out of the ground, but they're way up in the UP. Um, and it's just, it's costly in terms of time or resources to get there. Um, the, I have another problem in that my area of specialty in geology was not focused on field work per se. So field geology, um, you know, like it just wasn't, uh, my thing. I, I did numerical modeling. I did coding. I was behind a computer most of the time. Um, I did do some work at sea, and I see Chad is reminding me to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, so my background, uh, I did my undergrad at Michigan Tech uh, in applied geophysics, um, and then I did my graduate work at the University of Rhode Island, and I studied marine geology and geophysics there um, in oceanography. So I have kind of oceanography and geology overlap. Um, so I have done, you know, field work was required in all of my degree programs um, to be able to graduate, but it wasn't always like the most 
you know, fun experience for me. It wasn't my strong suit. I liked math and numbers and nerdy coding. <laughs> um, and I think I even remember a time when uh, my, I think my field geology uh, TA in undergrad like made me cry. You know, it was like the first time I was ever failing at anything in, ge in uh, college. And I just, you know, was not having, I'm like, oh, I have dust in my eye, you know, <laughs> right? So, so for me then to take that experience and pivot and say, okay, you know, there's pretty strong evidence that field experiences are really important um, for my students. So how do I turn something that wasn't a great experience for me and is extra challenging because I'm in a place where there aren't a lot of rocks that stick out of the ground? How do I actually do this? How do I pivot and try to find some kind of uh, creative place-based, you know, kind of alternatives to that um, to bring this sort of essential experience to my students um, in, in a different way. So this, that's the whole then ta-da of this is some of the untraditional geology field trips um, that I have come up with. Um, okay, so, but first, um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about that process, the arc of facing my challenges and talk about some of the epic failures along the way that I had. So when, when we go to solve a problem, and I, again, I, I try to make this kind of general because I know, you know, not everybody is a geologist. So, so uh, one of the things <laughs> that I tried to do was to ignore that there was a problem to begin with, right? Everything is fine. I don't need to take my students in the field. Everything's buried in glacial sediment. It's, you know, like far away. And, you know, my students work full time at the same time as going to school. You know, I have some unique challenges in terms of my student body as well. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's not going to work for them to be gone for a weekend, you know, I got to be able to do stuff in a short time. And, you know, so I came up with all these good justifications for, for why I should be ignoring the fact that I should take my students on a trip. <laughs> um, and then uh, another, another um, attempt to solve my problem was to force it, right? I'm like, okay, you know, like, I've got to do the thing. I've got to, you know, load up the 15 passenger van and, and pile all the kids in and, and, you know, get my adjunct to drive a second van. We're going to take two vans and we're going to go all the way up to the UP. And we've talked to the people at Grand Valley and GRCC, and we're going to do this whole big collaborative thing. And, and I'm, I think I was like two months pregnant at the time. So I'm super exhausted and, <laughs> And, and here we are in these vans and then I've got, you know, again, my students have kind of unique challenges a little bit. And so I've got a student who's telling me, like, I've got to sell my violin um, to be able to go on the trip. I mean, I tried to make it as, you know, budget friendly as possible, but she's going to do that. And I'm like, ah, no, you know, don't do that. Um, here, you want a scholarship, you know, to be able to go on the trip and, and just secretly on the side, I just paid for it. And so she came along and, and <laughs> I don't know, with the extra money she saved, I suppose, or something, uh, bought alcohol and her and another student drank all night long <laughs> the night before we went on field stop. So every single stop along the way, her and the other student are off in the trees, like vomiting. And, and I've got, you know, the, this van, you know, like, you know, you're stop and go, you're like, go to the next outcrop. Okay, stop again and go. And, and it's just terrible for them. And they're, sleeping in the van and it just was this epic failure I think my adjunct's van um, was a different kid I don't know if it was motion sick or too many caffeine pills but he vomited all over in the van we had mud all over the vans uh, my adjunct had scraped the side of the van on an outcrop when we were at one quarry stop um, when we got home, it was like three in the morning. We got all the students squared away, but then we had to go refill the vans with gas. And when I went to pull out, I took the corner too sharp. And the, you know, those like cement pilings, like I scraped along the side of the van, right? And these are like rentals through the college, through enterprise, right? And so 
damage. And I'm like, oh, you know, this is just terrible. Um, and then come to find out that the, the maintenance person who I'd worked with to fill out the rental information said, oh, well, the sports teams never take the insurance. So she didn't bother to even ask me if I wanted it. So we didn't even have like the insurance to cover stuff. So my department budget had to cover the damage. And it was just this on top of, you know, it really not being my comfort zone. It was just this epic epic <laughs> you know so that van there that's in flames okay it wasn't damaged that bad but oh my gosh it sure felt that way right so you know like give up run away never doing that again I'm never gonna just forget it not worth it <laughs> whereas you know sort of my my mindset where I was at so then what you know this is still you know, that kind of field experience is still really important. Um, so <clears throat> what do I do next? Um, I tried to overcompensate. Um, I will do all the other things, all the things, right? Um, except the one thing that I'm avoiding, right? Um, and so I, I started a museum on campus. Why not? Everybody does that, right? Um, so I made a, a hands-on science museum um, and I'm like, I'm gonna scaffold the whole thing. The college students are gonna design the exhibits, but then when we have K-12 groups come through and visit, you know, like the college students will be teaching you know, the, the K-12 visitors and, and it'll be this whole thing and it, it ties in. We already have a planetarium on campus. And so I got super involved with that. And I'm, you know, now I'm nine months pregnant and I'm up on the ladder, you know, like pinning stuff and my, my secretary is coming by going, what are you doing? <laughs> Get down, um, you know? And so, uh, you know, I tried to be really creative with making sure that my students were getting, you know, hands-on, science, you know, experiences, um, you know, and I really focused on scientific writing in another class and, you know, getting them to think about different styles of writing. Okay, you know, a proposal is different than a white paper is different than, you know, like a, a research paper and kind of getting them to, you know, delve into kind of the other overlaps. Um, and, uh, but I was still, you know, kind of like ignoring the elephant in the room, like they really need these kind of field experiences, they need to, to look at rocks in the face, you know, or get their hands on them. Um, and so the, the, uh, the, the kind of end solution to this, and actually like, to be perfectly, you know, like, honest, i I'm sort of misleading the progression here. Step four isn't really kind of step four. I was sort of improvising and, and reflecting and brainstorming all along the way. So actually like um, the, the first iteration of my, my ultimate solution here to, to these untraditional uh, field experiences actually kind of didn't come you know, after all of that. It was sort of at the same time, but the timeline gets a little messy. So. So this, this kind of, you know, improv, improvisation, um, you know, I wanted to emphasize too, you know, that, okay, I could give this talk and I could just talk about the end product and it would seem like this really short, beautiful process that I just magically came up with this great idea, but actually, you know, like, as you've heard, um, it's come along with a lot of like epic failures and it's been a decade in the making, right? Like, so, um, it's, there's a lot of let it stew, dust it back off, you know, like even some failures within the improv, um, but with glimmers of hope, you know, that I could kind of pull out the parts that worked um, and kind of make something that that's different, you know, not a lot of my, my peers do it this way, um, but that I'm really proud of it in the end. Um, and, you know, not to say it's perfect either, um, that, that there's still changes and tweaks and improvements that it needs. Um, and so I'm hoping too, that in the end, you guys, you know, as fellow educators and probably with a lot more tr formal training and pedagogy and things like that, um, it can give me some pointers on, you know, what do you, how could I make this better? Um, so that's where we're headed. Um, so in the end, I keep trying to use my arrows, but they don't work. There we go, click. Um, my solution um, was an untraditional style for some geology field trips. 
Um, and there's a few different varieties. Um, the one that I'm mostly going to focus on um, for the, the remaining part of our time here is what I call an urban geology lab um, that has a kind of a focus on natural resources. Um, it's somewhat more accessible. Um, it's kind of all around us, relatively low cost. Um, it's not problem free, and I'll talk about some of those challenges that I still face with it, um, but it, it's more adaptable than just having to take students to a place where rocks stick out of the ground. Um, there are a couple other styles that um, might be useful um, for you guys to hear about, so I thought I'd mention them too. Um, doing virtual field trips, especially in the last couple of years, there's been a push to, um, for greater and more detailed development of those kind of things. And so I have, you know, a slide with some links and some resources there. Uh, one of my favorite ones is uh, from Arizona State uh, University. They have some really well done. Uh, you can go to the Grand Canyon and it's it's on the screen, but man, it's right there in your face and you feel like you're there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and there's another program I just, I can't recommend enough. Um, it's called Skype a Scientist. Um, even if you are not a science class, there's such a wide variety of different scientists. And I have a slide with, you know, what that variety is. Um, it's a great program. You just sign up. They match you with someone. You talk to that person to arrange the day and time. Um, and they Skype into your class and talk to your class. And it's just such a great, I've, I've never had a bad experience with it. Um, and it's a really cool way um, for the students to you know, get to hear someone else be excited about, you know, whatever topic they're learning. Um, and it's a great program. I like it, especially because I can purposely highlight diversity. Um, I can request a scientist that's, you know, LGBT, or I can request a female, or I can request underrepresented in science groups, um, which especially for geology, and I don't know if you guys know this, um, but uh, it's one of the least diverse diverse sciences. So even, I don't know, I mean, if you ask someone, you know, what they think the least uh, diverse science is, maybe they would guess physics or computer science or engineering or something like that, but it's not it's geology. Um, and I, I mean, maybe it's my own personal bias <laughs> about fieldwork, but I think fieldwork might even be part of the problem. I mean, if you think about even the words fieldwork, right, are associated in some cultures with a negative connotation. Um, and so, you know, if you're thinking about who's your typical person that's going to go crunchy granola hike in the mountains, um, you know, it, it's probably not a diverse individual that pops into your mind at first. And I think that's part of the problem, right? And, and so, number one, anybody can go do that. Number two, there's so much more to geology, too. Like there's so much more you can do than just go out and look at some rocks, right? And so that's, I'm, I'm somewhat passionate about that end too. Um, so, so it's, a, so it's a, an interesting <laughs> ball of wax that I've gotten myself into here. Okay, so I think I've probably been uh, talking enough on my own here um, for a little while. So it has come to that time where I, I would like us to kind of break out and give you guys a chance to sort of discuss about what you've, you've come up with so far. Um, so think of a time, you know, maybe you have uh, an untraditional uh, assignment that's a little bit different than what everybody else does or how everybody else presents something. Um, or maybe you're not even to that point. Maybe you are in the process of ignoring your challenge <laughs> and you want to talk about that or or you've, you've tried to conform and do it the way everyone else does and it just doesn't work, but you haven't come up with something yet, you know, that's okay sh to share too. I feel like that can get us, uh, you know, we can learn a lot from those kind of things. So bonus points, if you can, you know, talk about some time you failed, uh, but kept going. Okay, so um, as as we know, as we all know, uh, make sure that you accept the uh, breakout room request when you see it. You will be in groups of about uh, five, four to five folks. Um, and how many minutes are we going to be in here, Amber? Uh, I think we, we said like eight minutes or so. Eight minutes. Eight minutes sounds good. Uh, that brings us back at 430. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, chat in the prompt again once you get in there. But again, sharing experiences uh, that, you know, 
when you're working to to present some um, unique content or maybe in a unique way or or maybe you're still trying to do that maybe you've successfully done that um, share that with your group and then we'll do a little bit of a share out on the other side all right so we'll see you back here in about seven eight minutes and off you go in three two one And then I need, do I need to reshare my screen here like that? Okay. There we go. All right. Um, just so a few minutes, um, hopefully the discussion went okay. I know there were some questions in our group about, you know, does this challenge have to be directly related to geology and certainly not like I, I tried to make this, you know, general on purpose so that you could share, you know, whatever challenge you overcame or your untraditional approach to something um, from any uh, subject standpoint. Uh, does anyone have, you know, something that came up in their group they wanted to, to share? While they're, while they're thinking about that, Amber, uh, let me just, just remind folks that, again, like, the, the types of sessions that you experience will be in all sorts of topics, science or art or other things, but we always strive to introduce uh, these different subject areas in ways that can be applied in any subject area, um, but it happens to have a kind of a, a geology twist. Um, and I will just share uh, maybe an experience that I had where I was trying to figure out how to present certain content. For me, as an English teacher, it was presenting Shakespeare. I did not have a good experience with Shakespeare in, in high school. Um, <laughs> You know, I didn't understand why in the world we were even being, you know, ex you know, tortured with this stuff. Um, but uh, but I came to really appreciate it in college. And then here I find myself uh, a high school English teacher myself and with the same challenge. How do I give my students a, a different way to experience Shakespeare than I was that I had? Um, and what I came up with was, uh, again, something untraditional. Um, I um, asked the students uh, we were using digital cameras it was when they first came out. Um, but I, I was ha having my students use digital cameras uh, to create uh, stop action uh, recreations of different acts that or scenes that you, that we were reading, right? And so, uh, and and so, you know, I, I showed them how to use the camera, showed them how to use the technology. That was its own lesson in and of itself, right? And then we did, you know, so they did that uh, particular act, you know, like you know when when Julius Caesar is getting getting done in by you know uh, by uh, 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 oh my goodness. Uh, Brutus? No. Brute? To Brute, yes. And, um, and uh, but in any event, uh, so what was interesting, though, is that, you know, they did the voiceovers. They got so into understanding the act and understanding what was actually happening, despite, even though it was in this old English, you know, uh, format, that they really loved the material. They understood what was being said and they really appreciated, you know, the, the drama of it all. And to see, you know, uh, and we did the stop action with Legos, by the way. So it was Legos. And so it was like a Lego, like recreation of, 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 of different acts and, you know, and, and with crazy voiceovers and sound effects. And, and I have those, those uh, films to this day. Uh, but that was, that was how I kind of approached it. And it, it did work out, but I had other fails though as well, but that I would share success. And so, I don't know, does anybody else have a, 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 an attempt that they would like to share uh, with us in terms of presenting content to their students in, in a creative way that did or didn't work out. It looks like we have A plus students today, Amber. <laughs> we have A plus students. So no failures. <laughs> All right. Hey, that's okay. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to um, expand a little bit more um, on this particular uh, thing here. Sorry, I'm just getting all my <laughs> all my screens out of the way here. All right, um, and so like I wanted to dig into this process of like, you know, how did I go from 
you know, having this challenge to actually, you know, getting to the point where I have this untraditional activity. Um, and so I kind of had to take a step back and say, you know, like, what assets do I have? Like, okay, if, if I had this problem, I don't have rocks that stick out of the ground. What do I have? Um, and I kind of laugh and I put up this, this screenshot from uh, the movie, The Princess Bride. And I don't know, I mean, how old is everybody these days? You know, like I keep getting older and, and new, new teachers are younger every time. Hopefully you guys have heard of this one. Um, and there's a scene in the movie where, you know, that kind of the main characters are sitting there trying to like figure out how they're going to storm the castle and, and the, the, um, you know, the main hero there in the middle, you know, turns to the indigo and he says, you know, what assets do we have? And, and uh, he lists off some very obvious, you know, low hanging fruit, you know, we've got his strength and, and my sword and your brains and, and he's like, oh, impossible, you know, if only I had a wheelbarrow and a Holocaust clip, you know, and, and the, the Fezzik there pulls one out from under his shirt, like he just happens to have it. And I feel like it was kind of one of those moments for me, like, where, you know, I was like, but where are the rocks, you know, and, and I just kind of took a step back and <laughs> out of, out of his shirt came, you know, like, oh, there's rocks everywhere, <laughs> all around us all the time. You just have to think a little bit differently, you know, maybe it's not in the form of, you know, a, a big mountainside, but I can go to all these different places that have rocks. And, you know, for, for you guys that maybe aren't, you know, working with geology all the time, you can use the same kind of frame of mind in whatever topic. So, you know, if you're a math teacher, I mean, I know you've probably practiced this already, you know, like how do I get my students, you know, the traditional way to give them math problems is out of the book or with the web assign, you know, problems, but where else can I find numbers? Oh yeah, they're everywhere all around, you know, take your mom's grocery receipt, you know, now you've got some math to do, check it, see if it's right, or, you know, whatever thing, um, or even, you know, you can tie in and overlap with kind of inter interdisciplinary, so I'm looking at natural resources and building stone, but that has social studies implications as well, I mean, if you think about where do resources come from, how are they distributed across the globe, how, what bearing does that have on political relations or war, you know, the, the price of oil just skyrocketed and how do, you know, how do all these things tie together and how does that relate to the world around us and so um, taking that step back and say, saying, you know, oh, I'm an English teacher, you know, where do I traditionally get all my resources? Oh, from, you know, Shakespeare, from, you know, prose, from books and stuff, but, you know, where else do I have stuff written down? Oh, yeah, <laughs> everywhere, you know, maybe I take my students to a museum, and they read the blurbs, and maybe they do, you know, an analysis of, you know, how is that type of writing different than another type of writing? Or, you know, how do you simplify it? Find one that's too complicated. You know, that one's hard for me to read. Which one did I spend more time in front of reading? You know, like that one was too long. And so what, how do people approach communication? And, you know, all that stuff is all around us all the time. And we don't always think, you know, take that step back and say, okay, you know, like we can get learning in a different way that might, grab our students' attention um, too, because it is different and untraditional. Okay, so um, continuing on this evolution. So, so what assets did I have? How can I find, you know, rocks and minerals that are available and nearby and, you know, that relatively inexpensive? Um, so there's a few, there's actually a ton of places. They're everywhere, right? Um, in buildings, in statues, monuments, things like that, uh, landscaping stone. Um, this picture on the left is from a mini golf course. Actually, like, I'm, as a geologist, I'm kind of secretly really annoyed at this picture because that rock is really boring and uninteresting. But <laughs> the mini golf course right near me, uh, I live in, in near Muskegon, Michigan, and so there's like a Craig's Cruisers, which, you know, if you've ever vacationed at Hoffmaster State Park. It's just down the road from there. There are some 
awesome rocks in their mini golf course. <laughs> like, so here's my husband and my, my son and I doing mini golf. And here's me with my phone camera, like right up by the rock. And they're like, all right, it's your turn to golf. The people behind us are waiting. And I'm like, hang on, there's a really cool porphyritic basalt right here, you know? <laughs> like, um, you know, so you can find these things in, you know, the, the most different places and the students can learn from that. There's a rock in front of their face, you know, it's there. Um, there's other places, cemeteries, uh, monument companies. I mean, these kind of things are everywhere. So, you know, you don't have to be in a place that has, you know, outcrops sticking out of the ground for rocks to be apparent and, you know, able to visit and learn something about them. <clears throat> um, so I had my students go to some uh, local restaurants. Uh, we actually had a place I don't know if they still do this. I would have to check into it. Um, but they had, you, they, they called it a lava rock, okay? And it's this kind of like black square that you see um, in the left two pictures there. Um, and, and they would heat it up so it was hot and you could cook your food on the rock, right? It was this kind of novel thing. I think there's one in the Flint area too. I saw, I noticed a few, guys, a few of you people mentioned um, that you're from kind of that area. I think they have these kind of restaurants. Um, and you know it's it's kind of interesting because that actual rock type that's there is is did not cool above ground it did not cool extrusively um it cooled intrusively um so it's it would be like magma not lava right um when it was cooling um so so that's kind of a neat you know i had my students be like oh they called it a lava rock but they're wrong you know like why <laughs> think about it you know and stuff like that and and i talked to the restaurant and i said hey you know i might have some students come by and you know maybe not everybody can afford to to buy the meal but could they look at one of these rocks just for their scavenger hunt and um the, the, they did one better and they're like, hey, we have a broken one, you know? And I was like, perfect. Because if it's broken open and it's not that kind of polished flat surface, you can sometimes see more detail. So that was really cool. So the one on the left there is the broken, the broken one that, that, you know, they just had to ask behind the counter and the, the person would let them see it. Uh, stones in the fireplace, uh, any other indoor public places might have that kind of, you know, rock. <clears throat> Um, my other favorite place is home improvement stores. Um, and I don't know, I mean, so my son's in third grade and for the last couple of years, they have the same kind of math book. And are you guys familiar with the, the penguin that gets all the problems wrong? Do you know what I'm saying? Anyone know what I'm talking about? There's like a, it was math like a puzzled, puzzled penguin. So puzzled penguin always gets like the, the math problem wrong and the students have to like figure out, you know, what the puzzled penguin did right, did wrong and, and fix it. Home Depot <laughs> is my puzzled penguin. Um, they just call everything granite. It's just granite. It's all granite countertops, every single one. But, you know, to a geologist, that's not, it's not granite. <laughs> like there's like one or two of them that are actually granite. And then like everything else is actually a different rock type. So this is this is the best place to like send students to be like, okay, they're wrong, you know, and, and it's your job to like figure it out and, and prove them wrong and say why and like, and use the knowledge that you've gained. Um, so that's super fun. You know, it's just like a different place. I feel like Home Depot is like, a, or, you know, Menards or wherever. Um, is a great place to send students. I feel like that'd be a great place for fractions too. Like any student that isn't convinced that you need fractions in life, just talk to the lumber people, like walk <laughs> walk down the aisle of two by fours and four by fours and, and you know, three eighths something or other, right? Like I think, I think that's a really great place to find a lot of like untraditional resources. Um, not a grocery store or anywhere really. Um, okay, and, and, they're in a lot of places, right? So, so that's another problem that I have is, okay, I've come up with this urban geology lab and I'll get into more details here in a minute. Um, but one of the problems I still face with it is that it's local. And now that I'm online and asynchronous, some of my students don't have to be here. So I've had students taking my class from Arizona from Florida, from Texas, 
um, from, you know, like they traveled on spring break or something and they're just doing homework from wherever they happen to be. Um, and so, you know, if that lands during this week or if they're living somewhere else, I can't really have them, you know, go to our local place. So I need to come up with something that is local to them. Um, so that's a challenge and an interesting, you know, aspect of, of uh, trying to think outside the box for this. Okay, so so now that I have, okay, so so I do have some rocks, but then what can I do with them? You know, how can I design an activity that is, you know, still inexpensive in terms of time and resources and that it's accessible and accessible, right? Um, you know, and ideally that assessment would result in saying like, okay, this activity is effective, Right, and so that's our ulti my ultimate goal is is to have all these boxes be checked, you know, with whatever activity I have. And honestly, I, this is still an ongoing process. So I don't think it's perfect in all of these um, areas, right? I think it could be more accessible. I think it be could be more effective. Um, and so I'm always, like I said, this has now been, you know, kind of a decades long process to get to the point that I'm at in terms of, you know, like iterating and picking out the parts that work and tweaking the ones that don't and fixing them. Okay, and so what did I what did I actually do? Um, uh, in my in my first iteration, right, my first time trying, I'm like, okay, I have all this stuff. Um, let me just do it all, <laughs> which was way too much. Um, so so I first made you know the scavenger hunt, and I included all those locations that I mentioned at the. I don't think I added the mini golf course, but but I did buildings downtown. I did the monument company. I did, they had to do a cemetery. They had to swing by the Home Depot. They had to go to the restaurant. They had, they had like, <laughs> it was a lot. It was way too much, right? Um, and, you know, the context of it was, okay, I was still teaching in person. Uh, we, they were doing hands-on lab, identification labs. Um, and this was just an optional activity um, that they could use to replace uh, like a lab test. You know, they had a, a, once they had learned all the rock and mineral identification, they had a little, you know, qu a quiz of unknown samples. Um, and so I said, okay, if you don't want to do that, you could alternatively, you could do this scavenger hunt. And it's a lot of work, but, you know, it, it's, you know, in place of this, you know, quiz score that you would have to sit in class and sweat over. And so I think some of them were very happy to avoid that quiz. Um, but then, you know, we're like, oh, that was a lot of work, right? The feedback was, you know, it was way too much. Um, and I also found that there was not enough guidance, right? I wasn't with them, you know, pointing out all the things to notice. Um, there was a few, you know, some spots where I was like, okay, uh, you know, take a picture of you with a rock and, and, you know, they were pointing at a brick or the stairs there that are cement, you know, and that, that aren't really rocks, you know, they're man-made, you know, out of rocks, but, but they're not naturally formed rocks, you know, that have been cut and put in the building. And so um, some, you know, like mis misguidance there. Um, and then accessibility is still an issue, right? Because they, they have to have transportation. If we're outdoors, you have to think about the weather and all that kind of stuff. Um, and the assessment piece wasn't perfect either. It was kind of this photo journal thing where they just sort of took pictures of themselves, you know, at these stops along the way. Um, and, the, you know, that was okay, but it was sort of hard to gauge, like, you know, how many points is that worth? And, you know, how do, are they going to be able to get the test question right now that, that asks them about identification and things like that? And so I had a challenge there as well. Um, and so I kind of just set it aside. Um, and it, it kind of went into that, you know, cycle of let it stew and dust it off kind of thing. And, and then, I don't know, I feel like this is the tagline to everybody's stories they to say is, and then COVID, right? And now my students aren't going to be in the lab. So now I have to get rocks in front of their face, even like not just in addition to the lab activity, it needs to be the lab activity. Um, there's a couple different ways that other geology uh, professors have solved this problem. Um, some kind of pulled together identification kits um, and then, you know, had the students check them out at the library or at the bookstore, 
I talked to my library, I talked to my bookstore and they were like, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, and I was like, well, I'm not managing it either. <laughs> um, you know, cause it's a lot of work and it's a lot of maintenance and it's a lot of cost up front to get all the pieces and label everything and all this stuff, you know? And I'm like, that's not gonna work for me. Like I can't, you know, we can't do that. Okay, so another alternative or another traditional way, um, just have the students buy the kit. Amazon, $120 for a kit they're gonna use, you know, maybe a third of the semester at most. I mean, that's, you know, that's, and then also on top of a book cost, if I have a book, you know, instead of using OERs or something, you know, um, and so I'm like, man, that's not going to work for my students, you know, like that, that, that's not fair. And now that you've gotten to know me a little bit, you know, that I feel a little bit strongly about, there's a ton of other really interesting geology besides field work, besides just identifying a rock. There's natural resources, there's historical geology where you're looking at like, what about the arc of oxygen through time? Um, you know, there's, there's just a ton of different fascinating avenues with climate science and environmental resources. And, and there's just so many other things we can do that I don't think we have to be experts in every single one right, that I can kind of shift my focus. So that's what I did. I sort of did a little bit of both. I shifted my focus. I brought in some more natural resources conversation and I dusted off this urban geology scavenger hunt and I turned it into um, a lab. And so my in my current iteration, I made a few changes um, and it, I, I made it a required lab activity for my online and asynchronous uh, students. Um, I cut out most of it and I just focused on uh, seven stops in downtown Muskegon. So on the left here, you're looking at um, a, you know, Google Maps view of downtown Muskegon on the left picture and the right picture are the same. It's just the right side has the labels for the streets that you can see so they can see, you know, what street to drive on. Um, and so what I, so then because they needed you know, a little more guidance from me, I went down and um, just took my cell phone and recorded videos of me at each stop talking about the kind of things I wanted them to notice, all the kinds of things I would do if I was there with them in person. Um, and then I, I built out, uh, I used Microsoft Forms. Uh, Google Forms is a similar kind of prep platform. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, use those in your classes. Um, so I built out a form that has the links to the videos and then has um, several multiple choice questions that go along with, okay, if you're at, you know, stop one and you're watching videos one through four, then, you know, after each video, it asks a little question about, you know, that I'm prompting in the video. Um, some more changes over, you know, the last two years that I've done this now, um, I recently added like a printable one. So if they could take notes while they were there, um, and then enter the answers later, it used to be that they had to be out there on location, you know, like kind of clicking through their phones or whatever. Um, and again, if we're talking equitable, you know, does everybody have a cell phone, that kind of thing. Um, but so I would always check on that kind of stuff first. Um, I do have an alternative um, option. If they can't do this lab, um, then I have them go to a local home improvement store and, and kind of do some things um, similar looking at, you know, which of these is not granite and that kind of thing. Um, I have a few pictures from the downtown lab. So and you can see like already maybe you can already see <laughs> that it's still not perfect right so um you know my my video recordings are not necessarily professional grade it's just me <laughs> selfie cell phone you know talking about stuff cars driving by and stuff like that um i've tried to make sure that they're captioned correctly so if you know the wind blows they can still read the caption and hear me but you know they're it's imperfect in some ways um, actually finding, especially in the winter time, <laughs> finding exactly which rock, um, I kind of go out there ahead of time and, and, and try to shovel and brush off the ones. Um, but, but, you know, making sure that they can find exactly the one that I mean to have a look at, 
um, in my in my future plans, depending on you know where it goes with this, I might actually go out there and like add little labels. We have, I mean, it's a pretty low tech way that we do it in the lab. We just take some uh, uh, glue stick, put a little hole punch, a number, glue it on, and then do clear nail polish over top. Um, and that's how we, we label the samples in the lab. So I thought oh, I could do that out there and it might last a couple seasons just so they could find a little number two and be sure that they're looking at the right spot or something, I don't know. Um, <laughs> again, accessibility sometimes, especially in the winter, uh, I try to shovel a path as best I can, but you know, if that's, if I have a student in a wheelchair, this really isn't gonna be, you know, that's not gonna work for them. Um, so how can I make it more accessible is always my challenge. Um, but it's been, you know, it's been fun to try to be creative with it. And I really, one thing I really, really enjoy um, is kind of forcing the students to come to downtown Muskegon. Um, I don't know, I think I, if I saw right, you know, most of you guys are from the east side of the state, I'm not sure, uh, maybe, maybe some from out here, but there is a little bit of bias um, about Muskegon. Um, I have a lot of students that'll be from Grand Haven further south or, and they're, they're not super comfortable going north of the bridge, you know, there's some, you know, like, oh, and every semester I have a student that says in the comments, like, I never realized how beautiful it was there. I didn't realize they had, I mean, they have a beautiful library. There's a, you know, with, and it's one of the stops, you know, it's got awesome sandstone and granite and, you know, it's just a gorgeous building. Um, and, and, and there's this big park in the middle with green space and it's, you know, it's just a really, okay, in the winter, it's cold. <laughs> the wind comes right off the lake um, and it's tough. So again, that, that, that's a tough, you know, like how do I get my winter students to enjoy it as much as my fall students, you know, it's still a challenge. Um, but I really do like having them branch out culturally. Um, and, and visit downtown Muskegon. I mean, it's a world renowned, you know, theater right there. This is, this is actually, in, this middle picture is in the traffic circle <laughs> and the, you know, so they have to be careful um, and that kind of stuff too. So, um, but it's good, it's good for them to know that some of this place exists um, and have, you know, some fond memories. Um, okay, and so I think I've mentioned most of the things I have on the slide in terms of, you know, the challenges I still face in terms of accessibility and, and you know, I'm still struggling for my uh, Home Depot assignment um, about, you know, what I need to record some videos of me there, but is every Home Depot the same? Maybe not. Um, and the assessment for that one is more like the photojournal style of, you know, like, okay, you know, research these resources, you know, what, look up what you can find, you know, where do they get this from? Oh, it comes from Brazil, you know, why, <laughs> you know, like, um, and that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, there could, there's some work I could do there. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, like, um, in the fall, I'll have an online sec section, but I'll have an in-person uh, section as well. Um, so, you know, do I say, do I just keep this for the online students? Do I bring this back to the in-person, you know, as a field trip one day instead of, you know, what we're doing in lab uh, on, you know, in, in the building or, you know, what kind of thing do we do? So, so I'm still, it's still iterating, right? Just like any, uh, any project that we come up with to, to work with our students on, um, that it's still kind of swirling around. So, um, the other aspect of this, um, and, and after I get through this part, we'll kind of do another breakout session and, and discuss a little more. Um, but the, the last bit of this sort of evolution of the urban geology lab is, is the ever important assessment, right? Like our admin are always pushing, how, you know, tell us about assessment. How are you figuring out, you know, does your activity work? You know, is this activity effective? How do I measure its effectiveness, you know? And just, you know, here's a reminder of, of those ultimate goals, right? I want it to be inexpensive and accessible, and I want it to be accessible, and I want that assessment to say that it's an effective activity. So how do I actually figure that out, right? And the first time through, it's nearly impossible. You know, I can't, I almost can't know that ahead of time. And so I'm um, trying to, you know, intentionally think about, you know, how can I make sure that I can check in on 
did this actually help them learn anything about geology? Um, and so um, I built in some questions for my students to answer about it. Um, I can look at kind of their scores versus, um, you know, some of the other sections of the course. Um, and so I have a few, I've kind of pulled from an end of course survey. This was, I had 60 students uh, finish out the course in fall 2021. So just this most recent fall. Um, and I had a few different areas where I asked them questions about this. So um, there was one place where I kind of list all the different sort of topics that we cover in the class. And I say, you know, did your understanding of that topic increase a lot, increase a little, stay the same because you knew it before, stay the same because you still don't get it, um, or decrease a little or decrease a lot, right? And so for the most part in the class, um, for most of the topics that we cover, um, more in, in particularly in rock and mineral properties and identification, more than 80% of the students said, okay, yeah, my understanding of that topic increased a lot or a little at least. Um, but I still had like 11.7%, uh, I think that's like seven students out of 60, um, say that their understanding stayed the same and they just still don't understand this topic. And okay, you know, like maybe, 12% seems pretty small and I should be pretty happy with 80% said they got something out of it. But just as a context, um, if I compare that to the other topics that I cover in the class, um, there's only one other topic that has a higher percentage for that kind of, I still don't get it um, category. And that was like a numerical dating, which tends to be really math heavy. Um, and, and it doesn't have a lot of visuals along with it. So it's really hard for them to to kind of wrap their head around. And so this is up there with that one. Um, and, and there aren't many, you know, uh, it's this percentage is a lot lower for, for many of the other topics in the class. And so this is still up there in terms of, you know, getting some feedback that it's still hard to do. Um, and that is that kind of like, this is hard to understand um, is, is that feedback is reinforced by one of the open-ended prompts that I have where I kind of ask them, okay, out of all the lab activities we did, you know, what was the easiest or the hardest? What one did you learn the most or the least? Which was your favorite uh, or least favorite? And, you know, there's some, like I get the usual responses in terms of uh, if they have a prior interest or if they have no interest in that topic. So if they, they were previously interested in rock and mineral identification, then they love this activity because they just already were interested. Or if they just were not interested in it at all, they tended to not enjoy it, right? So there's some usual, you know, responses at that end. Um, but kind of the bulk of the answer, um, and kind of the middle ground where I got the most, um, the most people kind of speaking up with something different than that, um, was that this was the hardest lab, but also enjoyable. Um, so I would say, you know, that's the the most frequent response I get was something along the lines of like, this was still really hard to do, um, but it was really cool to, to get out there and do that um, and be hands-on. And, you know, I was forced to go to Muskegon and I realized it was beautiful. <laughs> um, so, so, I, so some good and some, you know, bad in terms of, you know, like how do I make this easier, easier for them? You know, how do I make it not so frustrating or how do I make sure that I catch those people that they're just struggling and they just still don't get it. Um, and so I also, I, I kind of prompt them for, for some further feedback that, that if they tell me, you know, this lab wasn't very effective, I follow up with like, okay, so if you said it was ineffective, like how can I improve this? So of the ones that had marked this lab as being not very eff effective, um, the, the, there's kind of two, groups of, of feedback pieces that I have here and, you know, and how could I improve it? And one is just don't do it at all, <laughs> right? It shouldn't be required. Often offer an alternative upfront. Don't make, you know, because the way I have it set up at the moment is that, you know, this is the lab. And then if a student reaches out to me and says, you know, I'm living in Arizona, I can't make it. Or, you know, I'm, living in Grand Haven and I don't like to go over the bridge, then I say, okay, you can, you could do this alternative. And so I had, um, I had a student who didn't have a car, 
um, so couldn't drive. So I said, oh yeah, no problem. Here's this alternative, you know, like that you can do. Um, I think in his case, because he couldn't drive, he wouldn't be able to get to a Home Depot either. I gave him a virtual lab, a uh, virtual field trip, uh, which I have some links to those too. Um, so it, there was a suggestion to make sure to offer that alternative upfront so that students didn't have to ask for it, which I, I'd like that um, piece of advice, especially for accessibility uh, reasons, not having to, to work for that um, access. Uh, and then someone suggested, yeah, just do the kit of rocks <laughs> to identify instead. And I don't know if they, you know, they would be willing to pay, you know, the, the price of being able to do it that way. Um, I think then the complaint would be like, this lab is too expensive, right? Um, and then I did get some feedback that was useful in terms of if I were to continue this lab, it might be beneficial to do it in groups. Um, I've also thought about, you know, if, if we're in person, you know, me being there, or even if we're online, at least offering like an optional time where I'm there in person, maybe I'm saying the same exact thing that I say in the recorded video, but sometimes just that, you know, getting that in-person uh, contact can make a difference. Um, or, you know, then they have a chance to ask a question to clarify something I've said um, right there in person instead of having to email and, and wait for a reply and stuff like that. I didn't mention this somewhere, but I do give them like my phone number um, for, uh, for being able to call me if they're, you know, on a spot and someone says, what are you doing here? Why are you staring at the rocks? Or, you know, they have a question about like, what do you mean? <laughs> what, which of these, you know, snow covered lumps? Um, so they do have my phone number for that as well for that week. Um, so still, like I said, still kind of iterating on this, um, but I really, I, I do like that it, it's a little bit different. Um, it's, it's that untraditional, you know, maybe they wouldn't have thought, you know, that, that they were gonna go look at a building, but now that they have, I, it's, I don't know, I always tell my students, it's like learning how to read, right, is, is similar to learning geology. So like when you first learn that the letter A, you know, is, is two slanted sticks with a cross, you know, one stick across, and you start associating that symbol with a sound and words that start with that sound and all this kind of thing. Geology is kind of the same. Like you can never look at the letter A and not think, ah, apple, you know, <laughs> antelope, whatever. Um, you can't ever then walk by a building that's made out of granite and not, you know, now that you've learned it, it think, oh, that used to be magma under the ground and it cooled underground, not above ground. And, you know, like that has interlocking crystals that solidified from a melt. And it has all this like associated meaning with it. Um, and so it's just, it's kind of great sometimes to get them out looking at the world around them and realizing like, oh, all this stuff, you know, everything around us if it's not farmed, it's mined. That's it. <laughs> That's all we got. <laughs> um, and it, it just, you know, like, it's awesome to see their eyes light up and, and be like, oh, my cell phone. That's not just, you know, poof out of the air. It comes from the earth. And, and what is it made out of? Um, and what, what does it take? And what countries have those resources? And how does this tie in, you know? Like, um, so it, there's a lot of really cool um, things that you can can do with this. And again, it doesn't have to be geology necessarily, right? There's overlap um, in all of these areas, all subject areas that we can take either the framework and a, a similar kind of style of thinking about it untraditionally or take the exact same lab, only bring in some of your subject um, to it. So, um, that brings us to our second and final breakout room discussion. Um, and I thought it might be cool if you guys kind of thought about like how you might use an untraditional activity. And if you want to relate it, you know, if you want to say, okay, if I took my students on a, you know, to the nearest building that has is made out of rock, how could I tie my subject matter into it? Um, 
or if you want to think of you know an untraditional activity that's more specifically related or maybe like chad's example of you know making <laughs> lego figures reenact shakespeare how might you use an untraditional kind of activity in your teaching um and and or um you can discuss uh and help me out uh, what kind of recommendations uh for improvements uh might you build on on this kind of activity that I presented or what was your favorite part of it. Um, and and so again, kind of similar sized groups. Uh, this time the person with the farthest away birthday should talk first. So chat with each other, see when your birthdays are. All right, okay. So uh, again, uh, accept that uh, breakout. And this is super fascinating. So this is like one of those things where you're really thinking about how you can take the things that are right in front of you, like revealing the world that's right in front of your students and then using that to tie into your content. And so I think of this like, a, like how, there's so many different materials that exist right in maybe in, the own, in your own school building or within the community of your, of your students that you can use to like reveal like the, the rest of the story and then, you know, make that part of your content. So I would be very fascinated to see what you think about that and then share your ideas with each other, uh, as well as uh, some of your thoughts on um, this particular uh, use of geology, like in the world right in front of you. Uh, so fascinating. So you will be in there. Uh, looks like it's gonna be for about, uh, maybe about eight minutes or so. So we have some time for, for feedback uh, and sharing. And uh, we will see you back here in about eight minutes. And you're off in three, two, one, So, so we were talking about um, how I can um, connect geology with like Chinese teaching and cultural language. So, because China has like 5,000 years of history and then, uh, um, you know, like we can, uh, firstly, I thought about like, you know, the rock, like the history, the age of the rock, and then we can have students, you know, find the age of the rock. And at the same time, like we're, was china like the dynasty and the cultural mm -hmm. and then you know the the food and everything related so we were talking about that that is fascinating that is fascinating and yes i mean it, china is one of the few cultures in the world that you could actually <laughs> talk about it in, in a geologic sense you know my comment was that five thousand years is pretty short still <laughs> like we're not even i mean what the height of the last glaciation which is like our recent deposits in michigan is like twelve thousand years ago so okay. we might have to do some scaling but that could help give some context too indeed indeed any other any other folks have some uh, some thoughts uh anything that they wanted to share regarding um some the use of this this technique in their classes uh in their subject areas and of course you can put this in the chat if you wish as well i know that uh i think mark might have had one um regarding uh the, the kindergarten students i don't know did you want to share that mark yeah, yeah, I think you might have all read it. I know, I think that was just to me. Oh, was it just to you? Oh, mm -hmm. uh, after your comments about your field trip to around towns, I was going to put together a kindergarten trip to walk around and look at people's houses. And I didn't think of using the plastics like Chad had just mentioned or concrete, difference between concrete and asphalt. Uh, how many times do you get a kid saying that they're standing on cement when they're in the parking lot? Uh, it bothers me, but at the same time, they all need to know. Well, and, and to have them think about like, where does that come from? Right? Oh, like yeah. it's man, it's man made, but where does, where do why humans, is it sticky? you know, human made, where, you know, where do humans get the resources to yeah. make that, you know, does, there's no asphalt farm, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh. so. There isn't. <laughs> right? you know, the other thing I was thinking about, you know, and I was thinking about Mark's idea there too, is that, you know, as a, as a language arts uh, teacher, one of the things that I always struggled with was having students, because, you know, students, we are a visual species, right? And so, and we are even more so in a visual digital world. And so getting uh, students to express themselves with words 
you know, that capture the, the physical environment that they I see, you know, or that their, that their senses experience it's something that they they don't necessarily do like automatically, right? And so, as you're exploring uh, maybe the school, you know, or other communities, there's textures. You know, there's a, uh, an activity I used to do where I would pick an object in the classroom, and it was like you know, kind of one of those guessing games where the students had to describe it using every any other word except for one that directly describes it, right? Um, and so they'd have to describe its shapes, the way the color refracts, or maybe, uh, you know, the textures that they might, ex you know, that, that it might feel like. And you get them to think about that. And so when you were talking about this whole geology trip, that was where my mind was going, is that, boy, there's so many things that the students can explore, you know, texture-wise or material-wise that they can then describe and explain in ways that, besides a rock, right, or a brick. But, well, what, what do you mean? Um, and so that's great. Uh, Stephanie shared in the chat that she said every spring as she gathers pond water uh, to look at in their biology class. And this year, she'll take the students on a field trip behind the school to gather their own water to look at. Oh, yeah. And it's always great, right? You put that water underneath the microscope. There's stuff in it. It is moving. There's things in it, right? <laughs> or or Limey there's things that bite. <laughs> yeah, there's materials in there even. There's like little microscopic things. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. Anybody else want to share um, their their any thoughts that they have? Uh, any other maybe some improvements for Amber uh, to to make this make this thing better? You know, I I always get a kick out of talking to higher ed folks because they don't have a K twelve background like we do. You know, like their students paid to be there. <laughs> like our students have to be there. So is there any is there anything you can maybe share with her to to you know help uh, you know engage her students for instance? Um, you know, I'd be curious about that. I know while you guys are thinking about that, I'll, I'll jump in and say, Chad, like you're um, talking about, you know, using words to describe um, and make observations. Um, I do that same thing with art in my classes. So same thing, like, you know, maybe science class isn't where you think you'd be doing art, but I always have them draw something, you know, and, and when they're making observations, like their words beforehand, before they draw it and then their words after they draw it are just different because they've spent time staring at it. And if you have to try to draw it, you have to observe those textures and those, you know, and you have to start thinking about like, well, if I'm going to have to draw this, like, how does that, how do I get my brain to like wrap around it? I feel like you could, you know, the kindergarten classes or that are, you know, taking a walk around the block to to observe architecture or to observe the rocks that are in the building. If you have them draw it, they're gonna have to sit there and stare at it and like be, in, you know, engaged with it, you know, at least for a little short while, you know? Um, that might be a fun way to like bring art into it too. Well, one of the things too that you, you mentioned uh, earlier is the assessment part. And that's the part that we're always, as educators, we're always trying to figure out, okay, how can we validate this? Or how can we, you know, uh, show that there was learning going on? And, uh, you know, this does really provide a great example of applying some of these higher order thinking skills, which our administrators and, and you know, and our educational leaders are always trying to encourage us to do, whether they know how, what that actually is themselves or not. But in terms of synthesis, you know, uh, of taking different um, uh, disciplines, you know, and, and, you know, whether it's, you know, numeracy and literacy and, and, and synthesizing those things, you know, social, social studies and, and, and material science, they, you know, synthesize the, synthesizing these two um, subject uh, matters and then having the students be able to share a new uh, thought based on that, you know, is a fantastic example of higher order thinking uh, that isn't based on just recall or you know rote learning and so i really encourage folks to 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 think about this concept in that way um and even that little thing that you said that and i don't know if people picked up on it but in terms of labeling things you know and like putting little labels around like we have labels around the school already but you can make these little tiny little labels right and you put some uh, 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 uh you know nail polish over it so that students know they found the right thing you know, that they're, that they're looking for. Fantastic little tip. Um, and the one last thing, absorbing visible light in red and blue, yellow, green, purple, what color is it? <laughs> I love it. All right, well, I'll tell you what, uh, we are at the close of this session. This is fascinating. 
Um, go ahead, and I think uh, you have some, some resources here. I want to remind yeah. folks that you will be getting this in an email as well, but share, let them know what they're going to get. Yep. Um, so just, just a brief, you know, before we go walk you through, there's a couple pages of resources, just links that, you know, if you're interested in this kind of thing, um, this is that Skype a scientist. I, like I said, this is so, I mean, they have, you know, all the way from, you know, like community groups to K-12 to college, like the whole, you can click, you know, what age group you are. Um, there's a lot of other customization, but I mean, look at the list of different kinds of scientists you can get. I mean, it's so broad. Um, and I feel like you could tie in whatever you're doing to one or all of those. <laughs> um, and, and so that's really cool, check it out. Um, and then just a ton of different links to virtual field trips. This is if, if you need your students to have a break from, you know, like they're watching movies at lunchtime and you have to eat lunch in your classroom now because of COVID or whatever thing, and you want to put on something else besides, you know, you've watched, I don't know, Encanto five times and you just can't hear it anymore or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, this might be a cool thing to pull up. And just, I don't know, the one from ASU with the Grand Canyon is awesome. Uh, there's like birds chirping in the background even, like it's like you're really there. <laughs> um, so the audio on that's kind of fun. So tons of resources, other kind of places to look at 3D models of rocks. Um, the, the, oh, I put in here the what's in a cell phone. If you've never watched this TED talk, check that out. It's really cool. Um, they all, know about cell phones. So it's such a tie to what's immediately important to them. Um, so that's super fun. And, and that's about it. So. Wow. Well, thank you again, Amber. Uh, this was fantastic. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect, you know, necessarily <laughs> with, with this topic, right? But yeah, sure. I, again, you know, that's the beauty of these sessions. You know, you come in with one thing and then it sparks additional thoughts and, and ways for, for us to kind of continue to innovate and, and kind of progress in our own our, in our own area. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you all for joining us. And with this early afternoon edition of, uh, of our webinar series, um, thank you for joining. And uh, now you have the rest of your day and it's not even dinner time yet. So <laughs> thank you all. Talk to you soon. Great job, yeah, Amber. Yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah, thank all you. Right. And thanks. <laughs> I think Mark left, he, he had a good and a really sweet compliment there about you know, keeping up the energy. So that was nice. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Thank you, Eve. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, uh, Will, uh, Heidi, Sarah, Julie, Leslie. Thank you for joining us. Talk to you soon, Amber. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.